as I intro um, this great presentation that we have. Um, I wanna thank our sponsors for this Future of Preservation webinar series, the Peggy Ann and Roger G. Gary Charitable Trust. And I wanna thank all of our panelists for joining us. Um, I will intro them in just a minute. Um, but just to intro myself, my name is Katie Peace. I'm the Director of Communications for the Preservation League of New York State. Uh, we are New York statewide nonprofit. We are focused on championing historic preservation in every corner of New York State. We do that through a wide variety of programs, including making grants, uh, giving out loans, our Seven to Save Endangered Historic Sites program, our Excellence in Historic Preservation Awards program, our public policy initiatives, and um, public presentations like this one. Um, and so this particular uh, program today is going to focus on the Great Migration in New York, which is a huge topic, um, but we're going to kind of chip away at it a little bit with um, the help of a few very knowledgeable people. We are going to be welcoming Dr. Color Duo Simons, Dr. Jennifer Lamack, and um, two women from the Rap Road Historical Association, Beverly Bardiquez and Stephanie Woodard. Um, this pro program got started sort of um, because we are currently reading The Warmth of Other Suns in our preservation book club. And we thought that it might be uh, a fun idea to contextualize the Great Migration in New York specifically. And so we reached out to these, these women and they very graciously agreed to spend some time with us this afternoon. And we're really excited that um, you all are here to, to listen to them, to learn from them. Um, and we, we thank them so much for, for sharing their expertise with us. Um, and so the, the Great Migration obviously is a huge topic uh, from between World War I through World War II and into the 1960s and 70s. About 6 million African Americans came out of the South and settled everywhere around the North, Midwest and West, changing and influencing basically every aspect of modern American culture and obviously influencing a lot in New York specifically. So. Um, our presenters today are going to touch on that in a, in a couple of different ways, but first up we're going to hear from Dr. Carla Dubose simons who is a, an instructor of history at Westchester Community College. Um, her dissertation that she wrote was called The Second Wave of the Great Migration and its Effects on Black New York from 1940 to 1950. Um, that paper examined the demographic, economic, and social effects of World War II migration of Southern African Americans to New York City. So she's going to be focusing in her presentation specifically on New York City. Um, and then we are going to hear from Dr. Jennifer Lamack, who is the chief curator um, at the New York State Museum. And her focus is more on upstate communities. She um, um, wrote the book, uh, The His uh, Southern Life, Northern City, The uh, History of Albany's Rap Road. Um, and so she um, is deeply involved with the Rap Road community. She's worked with them for many years, done a lot of research, um, and she's very knowledgeable about how uh, the Great Migration influenced upstate communities in particular. And so we're really excited to have um, Beverly and Stephanie join in as well. Um, they obviously know Jennifer from her work um, doing research on the Rap Road community, um, but they are directly involved with their grassroots community organization, the Rap Road Historical Society that has done amazing work preserving and amplifying Rap Road, which is a community in Albany, a great migration community. And they're gonna share their lived experience living in a great migration community and advocating on behalf of it. Um, the League was um, honored to list Rap Road on our seven to save list in 2016, 2017. Um, and so we've been really lucky to work with them um, over the years as well. They've done a lot of amazing work um, in the Rap Road community and in Albany generally. So we're really excited have them joining us. Um, but for now, I'm going to kick it off to um, Carla to start her presentation. Um, and then I will um, be in the chat. If anybody has questions, you can drop them in the Q&A box. And um, everybody will um, try to get to those questions at the end of the presentation. So Carla, you can take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so pleased to be here with you. So bear with me just a moment. I'm going to share my screen because I have a few slides that I would uh, like to share with you all. 
So today I am going to be talking about the second great migration um, to New York City, as, as Katie explained. Um, and so I just want to start off by talking about what was the second great migration. The great migration was this longer migration of African Americans from the South to cities um, outside of the South from 1915 to 1970. So the period that I am going to talk about today is the World War II era migration, which is known as the second wave of the Great Migration. And this spans from 1940 to 1970. So after this second wave, more African Americans lived outside of the South than in the South. And so this speaks to the importance of the second Great Migration in this demographic shift before World War II, the majority of African Americans throughout the history um, of the country had lived in the South. And so um, when we look at the literature about this World War II era migration, most academic studies focus on cities in the Midwest and far West. So cities like St. Louis and Detroit and Chicago, uh, Los Angeles and Oakland, very few focused on New York. Um, and so that brought me to one of the reasons I wanted to study this migration. So I, I always think it's important to share a little bit about what brings scholars to the topics that they study. Um, and what really brought me to this topic was this beautiful little lady right here, my Nana, Mary Miller Wilson. Uh, she migrated uh, as part of the second wave of the Great Migration, maybe just a wee bit before, um, in 1938 or 39, when she was 16 years old, from rural Virginia to Harlem, New York, initially, and then she moved up to Westchester. Um, so it was her personal narrative, the, my, her migration story, like the migration stories of um, the people Isabel Wilkerson studied in the warmth of other suns that really motivated me to look to uncover some of the structural parameters and frameworks that shaped her experience. So what were the effects of this migration to New York? Um, there are two major effects. One is that there is a significant shift in community formation in New York City. And the second major effect that I wanna talk about today is activism for civil rights. So I'll start by expanding on this first point. Um, more than 200,000 African-Americans moved to New York in the 1940s. Um, Harlem, which was the center of black settlement in New York City from the turn of the 20th century became overcrowded and living conditions declined. And so this additional 200,000 African-Americans really exacerbated some of the problems that have been present um, in Harlem since the 19-teens. So what we begin to see is that African-Americans during the 1940s are moving to other neighborhoods, primarily in the outer boroughs. So um, in terms of thinking about what's happening for African-Americans in Harlem, um, African-Americans are paying higher rents. On average, 60% of their earnings were paid for rent. Um, higher mortality rates, overcrowding, and insufficient social services were some of the problems that emerged that prompted African-Americans to seek other neighborhoods to move to. We also see some Black middle-class um, residents moving to Westchester and Long Island. The second point that I have here about the major effects of this migration is this activism for civil rights. Um, recent literature on civil rights activism focuses on the movements for racial equality outside of the South um, in Northern and urban areas and the connections between these movements outside of the South and the Southern civil rights movement. Brian Purnell and Jean Thea Harris and Christopher Burrell and Clarence Taylor are some of the people, um, scholars who are studying this aspect of civil rights activism. But what we also have seen recently in the literature um, on civil rights has been um, a movement to kind of trace some of the roots for this civil rights activism of the 50s and 60s to earlier periods. And so I think that my research fits into both of, of these trends. 
So here we have an image of Bedford Stuyvesant. Um, this is one of the communities that I studied in my dissertation and really becomes the second central area for Black settlement in New York as a result of this World War II era migration. So this picture is called Living with the L and it's from uh, the Joe Schwartz um, it's a photo archive. And so I thought it was just a great image to get the conversation started about um, migration in the 1940s. Um, we have here some African-American children in Bedford Stuyvesant, but this idea of living with the L is really important because it shows the importance of access to transportation and prompting um, migration and movements of, of people to new communities. African Americans were moving to areas where they had access to transportation, um, particularly access to transportation um, for work. So Bedford Stuyvesant became known as Little Harlem. Um, why were African Americans moving to Bedford Stuyvesant? Preceding the World War II years, there was a small population of African Americans living um, in this area on one street, um, really in this area. And so um, we see more African Americans moving to this area during the 40s for access to better housing conditions and close, being close to the Brooklyn Navy Yards. This was a major um, wartime employer and jobs were one of the reasons that African-Americans moved to this area. So why was Bedford Stuyvesant called Little Harlem? Because this was the name that was given to the area contemporaneously in the 1940s. And so what we see are some of the same um, conditions emerging in Bedford Stuyvesant um, as we see in Harlem. So higher rents for African-Americans. And one of the reasons there were higher rents is that African-Americans really couldn't move to other neighborhoods because of racial discrimination. And so landlords saw an opportunity to make more profit because they could exploit those renters because they had nowhere else to go. And so they raised rents um, in Bedford Stuyvesant. Housing also became overcrowded as more and more African-Americans moved to the neighborhood um, and couldn't move elsewhere. Real estate values plummeted um, af as African Americans moved into neighborhoods. This is one of the things, the trends that we've seen um, if you study um, urban history is that um, real estate values declined in areas where African Americans and other racial minorities lived. And so as more African American residents moved into Bedford Stuyvesant, the real estate values there declined. We also saw increases in crime levels. So this resulted in what's called white flight. Um, initially, white community leaders organized to prevent black settlement, but when those efforts did not find success, whites left the neighborhood. And so what happened in Bedford Stuyvesant is that it became a black neighborhood, much like Harlem. The other area that I wanted to focus on um, was an area, a neighborhood in the Bronx um, called Morrisania. More specifically, it's the Boulevard Prospect area or East Morrisania area um, in the Southwest Bronx. So this area developed a little bit differently than Bedford Stuyvesant. Um, instead of an area that became primarily an African-American neighborhood, it became an integrated, ethnically diverse working class neighborhood. African Americans and Puerto Rican migrants joined and sometimes displaced working class German, Jewish, Italian, and Eastern European residents. Black population there more than tripled from about 23,500 to almost 100,000 people. The apartments in the Bronx tended to be newer, cleaner, less expensive um, than those in Manhattan. And so for African Americans, moving to the more senior section represented an opportunity for better living. So many Black residents of Morrisania um, worked in occupations other than the service 
jobs and the unskilled jobs that were typically available to black workers. Due to discriminatory hiring practices, African-Americans were relegated to the lowest paying jobs, most often service jobs um, or unskilled work. So in Morrisania, middle-class blacks were living there, postal workers and Pullman porters, teachers, garment factory workers, as well as black business owners. This represents a little bit of a difference um, in Bedford-Stuyvesant, it was primarily working class African-Americans that lived there. Oftentimes to Bedford-Stuyvesant, um, we see people moving from Harlem to Brooklyn, but we also saw black migrants from the South going directly to Bedford-Stuyvesant. In Morrisania, it was primarily African-Americans leaving Harlem and moving to the Bronx. So where do Black residents of Morrisania find housing? They're finding housing in the neighborhoods um, by acting as building superintendents. That's how they find apartments. And so typically we will see um, among these Black families, the husband or father um, taking a second job as a building superintendent so that the family could find an apartment in this particular neighborhood. So what's the advantage for African-Americans of settling in Morrisania? What does Morrisania have to offer? Newer housing stock than what was available in Harlem. More parks, particularly Crotona Park, um, which provided um, recreation space and um, entertainment and a pool. Um, it also provided black residents better schools than what was available in Harlem. Now we do see some negative um, aspects of this migration. Area rents increased similarly to what we saw in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Um, and there were some increases in juvenile delinquency in the neighborhood as there weren't as many um, sort of neighborhood resources and after school programs available for residents as the population increased. Um, however, as I said before, Morrisania really represented upward mobility and a chance for better living for African Americans in Harlem in the 1940s. There were, uh, it was also minimal racial tension with the integration of this neighborhood. Um, if you look at some of the remembrances, the oral history um, that's been taken by the Bronx Historical Society of residents of Morrisania in this period, um, typically, they talk about not really remembering experiencing um, real racial tension. Um, but despite the residents' remembrances, there were some incidents of racial tension. Those incidents, though, never really turned to violence. Um, so I'll give you an example. There was a Black family who had rented an apartment in Morrisania. Um, the father of this family was very fair skinned and could pass for white and he went rented the apartment, but when he went back with his family and the landlord realized that they were in fact African Americans, the landlord changed the binds, changed the locks on the apartment and did not allow this family to move in. So we do see there, right, with that example, some examples of racial tensions, but those tensions don't become violent, like what we saw with some of the race riots um, in other cities during this period, like in Detroit. So in adjacent sections of the Bronx, African Americans were not as welcome as they were in the Boulevard Prospect area. Um, and so I just wanna emphasize that this particular area was open to black settlement where other areas in the Bronx were not. So the other major, um, I guess, point that I wanted to talk about today was that we can really trace some early civil rights activism to this period um, in um, New York City. When we think of civil rights movement, we typically think of those mass demonstrations of the 50s and 60s, sit-ins and boycotts and marches. But we can trace some of these aspects of protest to earlier er eras. Um, and in the 1940s, we're seeing civil rights advocates employing the following tactics to try and achieve this goal of economic equality and to decrease discrimination. So boycotts were employed and pickets um, 
letter writing campaigns and use of media and collaboration with the government at the state and federal level. And so these tactics really um, are well known in the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, but we see these tactics employed in New York City by civil rights organizations in the 1940s as well. So this civil rights activism really focused on economics. And we see this economics-based activism beginning in the 1930s. It continues on into the war years as black activists were appealing directly to employers through delegations, through boycotts, and through picketing. Civil rights organizers were also working with labor unions to promote fair employment practices and organize to pressure the federal and local governments to protect Blacks from discrimination. So these civil rights initiatives found success in New York State and New York City. And so I wanted to use this company, the Sperry Gyroscope Corporation, as an example. So Sperry employed almost no African Americans before the war. And by the end of the war, they employed nearly 1,000 Black workers. That's a big change. More than half of those workers were hired in skilled or semi-skilled positions, which were jobs that really weren't open to African-Americans, not common for black workers before the war. These were higher paying positions um, and Sperry had become the focus of black protests for equal employment. So what kinds of pressure? Local black organizations um, wanted to pressure specifically these um, companies with government contracts to employ workers, black workers. Um, so the NAACP in 1941 brought, um, wants to bring a resolution to Congress asking for an investigation of the status and treatment of African Americans in factories, companies with um, contracts with the military to produce goods for the war. The same month, the Brooklyn Joint Committee on Employment asked NAACP's uh, Executive Secretary Walter White to head a delegation to the Sperry Gyroscope Company to try and get them to hire more African Americans. Now this Brooklyn Joint Committee on Employment was comprised of the Urban League and the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and the YMCA, the YWCA, as well as members of Brooklyn's Black clergy. At first, Sperry ignored their attempts, but um, it finally allowed a meeting with these organizations. But the company rep says, having blacks and whites work together would be problematic. This was sort of the general standard industrial excuse for not hiring black workers. And the spokesman said that he had no racial prejudice himself, but he claimed that um, if you had blacks and work, whites work together, whites would, uh, workers would be uncomfortable um, and that he or the company needed the quote, very best machinery, the very best tools, the very best techniques and the very best morale um, and the very best men to work in these factories. And apparently the very best did not include African-Americans even if they were qualified. So we do see some successes for the Brooklyn Joint Committee on Employment um, as they began to picket um, and organize these protests. Um, the NAACP also organized them as well. In July, the Brooklyn Council of the National Negro Congress pressured Sperry into allowing a Black Cooper Union College graduate to take an employment placement exam. And in the summer of 1941, Sperry hired its first Black workers. Now these hires seem to have been a result of the campaigns and public protests waged by these organizations. Years later, the general manager for Sperry, Ari Gilmore stated that though there, were, there wasn't a labor shortage at the time, top management believed that more workers were needed and the most logical people to employ were African-Americans. Gilmore also attributed management's change of heart to the work of Negro organizations, which had quote, much to do with convincing us of the logic and ethics of this policy. Government was really a, a huge target um, and a, 
becomes um, a collaborator for opening employment to African Americans. Black activists lobby government for passage and enforcement of fair employment legislation. At the state level in New York State, there was the Mahoney Act, um, which was passed in April of 1941, which outlaws discrimination in New York State war industries. At the national level, there was the passage of um, the Fair Employment Practices a co uh, Committee with the um, passage of Executive Order 8802. So this executive order by Franklin, President Franklin Roosevelt essentially um, banned discriminatory hiring practices by corporations with government contracts. In 1942, New York State Governor Lehman creates the New York State War Council Committee on Discrimination, which focused on essentially um, preventing discriminatory hiring practices and preventing once black workers were hired, preventing them from um, being discriminated excuse me, discriminated against for promotions. And so the activists pressure local offices of the FEPC and the New York State Committee on Discrimination to investigate allegations of discriminatory hiring. So the Brooklyn Urban League is really important um, in these kinds of, of activities. They launch investigations into claims of discriminatory hiring. They send evidence of discrimination to the New York State Committee on Discrimination. And we see some connections in personnel between the Urban League and the State Committee on Discrimination. And this allows for a collaborative relationship that is quite um, effective. So the Committee on Discrimination would basically get complaints that the Brooklyn Urban League had um, investigated, funneled to them, and therefore the Committee on Discrimination could investigate those allegations of discrimination and deal with those uh, companies accordingly. And so this ends up increasing the hires of African Americans in factories, including Sperry. 40% of Urban League placements were in higher paying, skilled and semi-skilled jobs for African-Americans. And this opened up new kinds of jobs to black workers. So we can definitely see some successes in these early civil rights um, movements, these activist sort of campaigns that's focused on um, equal employment opportunity. And I think this is something that is quite um, special for New York and New York State. Um, that we see these victories. There essentially um, was the passage of a, really the nation's first um, fair employment um, legislation at the state level that was permanent, the Ives Quinn Law in 1945, which outlawed discriminatory hiring um, practices by any employer in New York State. And so I, I just thought this was a, a good place to end in sort of thinking about um, the ways in which the second great migration in New York opens up um, these opportunities for employment and civil rights activism and change the community formations um, and places African Americans lived in New York City. So I am going to now transition to um, Dr. Jennifer Lamatt, um, who's going to take it from here. Thank you, Carla. Um, let's see here. Okay. So as Carla mentioned, um, and let me start by saying I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of this, this panel. Um, and this is a great topic to talk about. Um, so as Carla mentioned, um, 1.3 African Americans moved to New York State between 1910 and 19. 70. Um, and they had a huge impact on the entire state. And while the majority of the um, focus is usually New York City and Harlem um, as the black Mecca of the United States, uh, the Great Migration made a huge impact on upstate, specifically uh, the communities of Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, and Albany. Um, so we're going to try and get around the state a little bit in the time that we have. Uh, when I started doing research in, in Albany, um, I started with census research. And what I noticed was that most of the African-American heads of households in the census uh, came from areas directly south. 
Uh, so most of the folks in New York State came from Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And this is because that's the way the uh, railroad lines went in a north-south way, uh, in a north-south uh, fashion. However, in Albany, we see, and I'm going to um, talk about this in a little bit, and that's what Beverly and Stephanie are going to talk about. Um, there was a gigantic migration to Albany from Mississippi, um, which started from one man, Lewis Parson. Um, and in Rochester, we see a lot of folks coming from Sanford, Florida, which I will get into in a moment. And if you start to look at newspapers in each of these bigger cities, uh, starting in 1930, 1940, 1950s, automatically you're going to start seeing headlines dealing with the influx of African Americans to these cities. So even if you only looked at the newspapers, you could tell that something was happening in these cities and it was, it was changing the demographic. And like Carla mentioned, for most of the 20th century, um, the, there were um, housing issues in most of these cities. Um, and I would say one of the main reasons that African-Americans moved to New York State as a whole was because between 1840 and 1960, New York State was the leading manufacturing state in the nation. Um, and that was statewide, especially in the urban centers. So um, while a lot of folks are going to New York City, they're also going to places like Buffalo and Rochester and Syracuse and Albany because that's where industry was happening. Um, so a good place to start with that is Buffalo. And if you take a look at Buffalo's black population, um, Buffalo had a long established black community from the 19th century. Um, it was, but it was hugely affected by the Southern migration. Uh, Buffalo was an industrial and transportation uh, gateway. It was the second largest railroad hub in the United States. And in 1920, Buffalo was an important commercial center due to the presence of the Lackawanna Steel Company. And because of the Lackawanna Steel Company's um, prominence, it meant that other industries flocked to that city. This included chemical plants, auto and airplane industry, uh, petroleum products, rubber factories, shipbuilding, and print, even printing and publishing. Um, and the migration really kicks off in Buffalo uh, around 1916. Um, and in 1916, labor recruiters were sent south by a docking company to help uh, break a strike among Buffalo longshoremen. By the time the Southern workers arrived in Buffalo, the strike was over. Some of them stayed, some of them went back, um, but Southern blacks were recruited by labor agents two other times for subsequent strikes with the Buffalo Steel Company, once in 1923 and another time in 1934. Um, between 1920 and 1930, Buffalo's African-American population went from 4,500 to 13,500, that was a 200% increase. And this was all because of job opportunities in the city. Uh, most of the jobs that, um, that were relegated to African-Americans were um, hard, hard labor and menial jobs, but they were still paid more than they would have been paid in the South. Um, and similar to what Carla mentioned, um, in upstate communities, uh, housing was always an issue. Um, and across the board, New York State exemplified um, de facto um, segregation as far as housing goes. Uh, most of the time, African Americans had to pay higher rents for more rundown and dilapidated uh, rental units. Uh, African Americans could not get mortgages in New York State for a good chunk of the 20th century. So they were stuck renting in very specific areas of the, each city. In um, Buffalo and in most of the cities in upstate New York, um, the African Americans moved into the oldest parts of the city and specifically in Buffalo, they moved into the areas that were um, just along the industry line. So it was the most undesirable areas. Um, and in places like Albany, they were in the south end 
in the areas where most of the new immigrants arrived and then in a generation or two would um, establish themselves and then be able to move out of that community and into nicer areas of town. Um, unfortunately, because of discrimination, black families ended up having to stay in that those old and dilapidated areas and it they were hard pressed to um, move to the nicer areas of town until um, after the 1960s and 1970s. Um, and before I go to Rochester, um, I also want to say that Rochester is a little different than um, some of the smaller towns uh, and cities because Rochester's black population was so much larger than the other cities in New York State, with the exception of New York City, that um, after 1920, Buffalo was able to support a large amount of black owned businesses um, that specifically catered to the black community. Uh, some examples include specific real estate businesses, uh, mortuaries, furniture stores, beauty parlors, hotels, supper clubs. And in the 1920s, Buffalo actually had nine black newspapers. Um, in smaller cities like Syracuse and Albany, there were not enough, there wasn't a large enough black population to support all of these separate businesses. So the African American community had to learn how to navigate within the white establishments. And then Rochester. Um, in Rochester, in 1930, 60% of Rochester's African American heads of households were born in Southern states, mainly Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia. But beginning in the 1950s, this demographic starts to change and a majority of the migrants start coming from Sanford, Florida. In 1965, a survey of the black population in Rochester, um, it was estimated that 62% had ties to Sanford, Florida. Um, and this migration started with a man named John Gibson. And if anybody out there has an image of John Gibson, I would love to see it. Um, so the reason, and I wanna, before I start talking about John Gibson, I wanna point out, if you look at um, the population increase in the black population between 1950 and 1960 in Rochester, it is gigantic. And then it jumps again between 1960 and 1970. African Americans were pouring into Rochester in huge numbers, and it had a it had a long a long effect. So back to John Gibson, the area surrounding Rochester um, is the most fertile agricultural uh, region in the state. It's um, the principal fruit growing uh, region in New York, and it's referred to as the Fruit Belt. As a result of this, uh, many African American migrants would come to New York to harvest fruit um, in the summer and fall. And then they would go back and harvest fruit and vegetables down south in the winter months. Um, it was not uncommon for these migrant farm workers to decide to stay. And then they would kind of float into Rochester and, and decide to make a life there. But in 1929, two brothers, uh, Hal and George Fish, had a celery farm in Sotus, New York, which is 30 miles east of Rochester. And the brothers uh, would travel to Sanford, Florida annually, um, which was then America's celery capital, to buy and grow celery in the winter months. So between their two farms, one in New York and one in Florida, um, they could farm celery and fruit year round. Um, and then in 1931, the brothers asked one of their Florida workers, John Gibson, if he would bring a crew of uh, workers from um, Florida to Sotus, New York. And so on John Gibson's first trip north, he brought 25 African-Americans who sat in an open truck um, with benches in the back. And um, he, so, uh, and then he was supposedly arrested three times for illegally recruiting labor, um, but supposedly he had a letter from John Gibson explaining what he was doing and explaining that these migrants were gonna go home at the end of the season. Um, and then by the late 1930s, John Gibson was bringing two crews totaling 75 workers each year. 
Uh, one group would work in the fields and the other group would work in the packing houses. And this south north run went on for over 30 years. And each time uh, John Gibson would bring up an, a new um, group of people, there were usually six to 10 workers that decided to stay and make upstate New York their home. So most of them drifted into Rochester, they would settle down and then they would soon send for relatives to follow and they just kept coming. So by 1965, 62% of Rochester's black population had ties to Sanford, Florida. They had clubs set up and they were called the Sanford Nears. Um, so it's um, kind of interesting that uh, Rochester, similar to Albany, which we're gonna get into right uh, next, has specific ties to a very specific community in the South. Um, and, you know, one of the biggest um, encouragement to get families and friends to come is once you're established, you start calling or sending letters and telling your family members and friends how, how wonderful it is in the North um, and what the opportunities are here versus in the South. And that would encourage migrants to come um, more and more. So um, here are some images of African Americans working in Rochester. And then similar to the other cities in New York, um, African Americans in Rochester were relegated to very specific wards. The two areas that they were um, kind of stuck living in were known as the Baden Orman and Clarissa Street areas. And in 1950, 80% of Rochester's black population um, lived in these cities and they were living in only 6% of Rochester's housing units. Um, so I'm gonna say that again, because it's pretty, pretty important. 80% of Rochester's black population was living in only 6% of Rochester's housing units. Um, so African-American housing in Rochester was a huge, huge issue um, for about three or four decades. Um, and one of the problems be, of, of, of one of the problems in Rochester is that it had a huge reputation for um, low unemployment rates. And this was because there were high paying manufacturing jobs um, in companies like Kodak, Xerox, Bausch and Loam. Um, and they, they were expanding their companies greatly throughout the 20th century and they were making huge profits doing it. Um, so Rochester had this reputation for always having high paid uh, work available. Unfortunately, most of this work uh, required specific technical skills that most black migrants did not have. So that you would hear that Rochester had all of these great jobs and folks would show up, uh, but those jobs were not available for African-Americans. Um, and this uh, fact that African-Americans could not get jobs in Rochester, coupled with the housing crisis, um, led to uh, a civil unrest and um, eventually there was a, a Rochester riot in the mid 1960s. Um, what came out of the riot was the establishment of civil rights activities, more and um, more housing units and more places for African-Americans to live. Um, and eventually the black community in Rochester demanded that they open up jobs and they train um, African-Americans to become um, scientists and engineers at some of these um, skilled at, uh, jobs such as Kodak and Bausch and & Lohm and Rochester products. So because of the civil rights activity, similar to what Carla was talking about in New York City, um, Rochester was similar and by the 1970s, there were new public housing projects built and more African-Americans were elected to public office. And then in Albany, um, my favorite of all of the, the, the cities, um, Albany is, um, was a long time um, destination for African-American migrants because of its central location to 
New York City, New England, and Canadian summer resorts. Um, and Albany, the Albany and Saratoga area were home to a large group of black domestic and summer resort workers. Um, further, the proximity to the H Hudson Valley brickyards, um, the brickyards began hiring uh, African Americans in the 1880s and they stayed integrated through much of the 20th century. Uh, so we see smaller black communities um, in places like Queemans and Havistraw um, and African American migrants moved specifically to the Hudson Valley to work in the brickyards. In Albany, uh, African Americans, African American men were able to get work in the rail yards. Albany was the headquarters for the New York Central and the Delaware and Hudson Railroad um, and their repair facilities. And um, there was usually day work available at the Port of Albany, Albany Felt, uh, Allegheny Ludlam Steel, Tobin Packing, and the Waterville Arsenal, all hired African Americans um, in Albany, New York. And I chose this picture. This is the south end of Albany. This is where most migrants arrived and could find um, apartments uh, because there's an image of the Southern Lunch Barbecue. Um, and when African Americans arrived here in Albany in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, they most likely uh, lived in the south end and in the 1950s and 60s found housing in Arbor Hill. Um, and like I said earlier, this area, the area of the South End is where Italians, um, Jews, and some of the Southern and Eastern Europeans initially arrived and then were able to move to nicer, nicer places. And then here's another um, couple photos of downtown Albany, what it would have looked like when migrants arrived. Um, and the one with the snow is not much unlike what we're looking at um, outside today. Um, I have done interviews with migrants and the bad weather in Albany was a big reason why a few of them decided to, to go back to the south uh, because they didn't like Albany winters. Um, and I mentioned earlier that it's not easy to get from um, Mississippi to Albany. And the Albany Mississippi migration starts with this man and his wife, Lewis Parson and Francis Parson. Uh, Lewis Parson was born in 1902 and he was a part-time preacher in um, Bucatana, Mississippi. And he was a rural preacher. So he would, um, he would preach part-time on Sundays and he would travel to the little rural communities around Shibuta, Mississippi. Um, and he was a striker in a logging industry and was hurt on the job. And he received a large cash settlement because of that. And with the settlement, he decided to buy a car. And he said that he didn't feel comfortable uh, being a black man in the South with a large amount of money. So he and his wife, Francis, decided to drive North and reestablish themselves up in the North. He first goes to um, Ohio where his uh, sister lived and didn't like it there. And then he stopped in Buffalo and didn't really like that area either. And then he came to Albany. And when he was in Albany, he met a group of women who were doing um, a prayer circle in the South End. And he felt a kinship with these women and um, decided that he would reestablish his Southern congregation in the south end of Albany. Um, his first church was located at 40 Franklin Street, not very far from those uh, images I just showed you, um, within blocks of, of, this, of these, um, these buildings. Um, his first church was established at 40 Frank Franklin Street, and it was the first church of God in Christ. This church is still in existence in Albany. It moved to a couple places in the south end it was at 79 Hamilton Street for decades, and it is now currently at 121 J Street. So um, Elder Parson always, at, whenever he was asked why he came to Albany, he always said that God led me to Albany. And so this is the really 
cool part about Elder Parson is that once the church was established, he started to travel back and forth between Albany and Shibuta, Mississippi in his car. And he recruited members from his congregation in Mississippi and brought them to Albany to become members of his congregation here. Um, and he was one of his, I interviewed one of his um, relatives and she said that, quote, he saw a greater part promise for people to get an education and acquire jobs that were not picking cotton or digging in cornfields. Um, and as Beverly and Stephanie can tell you that um, because some of their family members came with Lewis Parson in his car, they loaded the car with as many people as they could um, and they would drive, they would pick them up on a Saturday night because everybody expected the um, African Americans in Mississippi, especially members of Parsons congregation would be in church all day on Sunday. Um, so nobody would be looking for them on Sunday and they would drive from Mississippi to the um, north of the Mason-Dixon line and then they could stop. They wouldn't stop until they got north of the Mason-Dixon line. And so Parson would drive back and forth bringing folks um, for his church uh, in the South End. And then once word got out that um, Albany, New York was better than Shibuta, Mississippi, uh, folks didn't wait for Parson. Some, would, some came on a Greyhound bus um, and others came from um, Parson's successor, Jack Johnson, who actually bought a bus to bring people back and forth. And Jack Johnson brought people back and forth um, to Albany from Mississippi between 1937 and 1957. Um, and here's an image of Jack Johnson is the, the tall gentleman in the back um, with a hat. I think you can see my cursor. Um, and all of these folks are people um, that Jack Johnson brought. So upon arrival in Albany, all of these migrants would stay with family and friends um, who were already established here. Most of them lived in the South End on Ferry Street, Dongan Avenue, Westerlow, Green Street. And as word of mouth spread, more and more would come. And so for the people that Parson and Johnson brought to Albany, they were deeply religious. They all attended church um, and church was a major part of their lives. Um, and when I say they attended church, they went to church four days a week, um, all day on Sunday. And at this time in Albany, the South End was filled with uh, gambling, houses of prostitution, bars, um, and it didn't really jive with a lot of the, the lifestyle that many of these deeply religious people um, wanted to live. Um, further, many of these folks came from a rural environment and were not used to living in the city. They were not used to going to the grocery store or the corner market to get all of their food. Um, so they missed that rural life. Um, and Lewis Parson had a solution for that. He was able to purchase a 14 acre plot of land in the pine bush in Albany. Um, if you think about the pine bush in the pine bush at this time in Albany was not developed and he sold tracts of that to members of his church. And that is where we start the um, Rap Road community. And I'm gonna turn it over to two descendants of the Rap Road community, uh, Beverly Bartiquez and Stephanie Woodard, um, because it's much better to hear the history from folks that have actually lived it. Hello. My name is Beverly Bartiquez. I am a third descendant of the uh, settlers of Rap Road. And I am, I hope you all can hear me. Okay. Uh, I have been in the Rap Road a community all of my life. And uh, I think what I'd like to share with you because Jennifer gave you the historical background of how uh, my descendants, uh, uh, how my family arrived in the North. I'm going to uh, 
uh, focus on my grandparents because I, I'd like you to get a sense of who came and how they came. My grandparents came to uh, Hattiesburg, Mississippi from Shabuda, Mississippi. And the reason they left Shabuda was because of, uh, they were sharecropper tenants and uh, they were always at the end of the season when it was time to settle up for uh, doing the, the gardens and, and uh, uh, doing their sharecropping, they were always being shortchanged or what we know as stacking the books. Their, their, uh, own, uh, the owners of the farms never quite matched what they felt they were due in terms of the uh, uh, work that they had done in terms of the sharecropping. So because they felt they weren't getting anywhere, they were being oppressed. The educational system was very poor. They, uh, their children, if they did go to school, sometimes they couldn't go to school for the whole uh, time because they had to watch the little children while their parents worked the crops. So, you know, education was an issue. Uh, the, the, the oppression with uh, stacking the books, the, uh, there was a lot of lynchings that went on. There were many things going on that made my grandparents decide it was time to move on from Shibuda to Hattiesburg. Hattiesburg seemed to have more work for people and uh, they stayed there for a time. But as Jennifer has mentioned, uh, Elder Parsons decided that he was going to start recruiting people from Shibuda to uh, Albany, New York, to the South End. And uh, my grandparents didn't come to Albany with Elder Parsons, but they followed the people to Albany in 1939. And in 1939, my great grandparents, my grandparents, my mom, who was a little girl of about maybe 12 years old and her siblings and a couple of her cousins boarded a Greyhound bus and came to Albany, New York. And when they got here, I had two uncles that were already here and an aunt and they stayed with one of the uncles so that they could uh, be here, uh, have a place to live here. Uh, the, one, the, the one uncle that they stayed with lived in a basement, and, but they, they managed to help them until they could see their way to get established. And like Jennifer said, they found work wherever they could um, my grandmother did domestic day work. My grandfather took work wherever he could get on for the day, whether it be the uh, Port of Albany or wherever they might have work for him for the day. So we uh, settled in the South End. And I remember my mom telling me that it was strange to her because all the houses were connected and she wanted to know why all the houses were connected. And uh, my, you know, because they were, she was used to open spaces, homes with flower gardens and gardens all around them. And now they were all crowded together in cities where, uh, in a city where the houses were all connected. Uh, the other thing was the living conditions weren't that great. Um, they, they had to uh, share bathrooms and that's something she wasn't accustomed to. Uh, and living in the South, you had outhouses, but you didn't have to share them. You had your own outhouse. So there were things that were very foreign to her moving from 
the South uh, uh, and Shibuda and Hattiesburg to uh, Albany, New York. The other thing that my, my mom found very different was the educational system because in Shibuda, she would have to walk something like six miles one way to get to school to a one room shack, uh, the school room. And the, the colored children would have to walk past the white children's school to get to their school. So she walked 12 miles uh, round trip every day to get to school. And uh, there was even a time when she had to repeat a grade because she had missed too much school because she had to stay home and help her mother with the children while her mother worked out in the fields and down south in uh, Mississippi. So it was, there, there was oppression and, and educational and like I said, lynching that kept them from coming, uh, staying in the South. Uh, my grandparents were eventually able to get their own uh, apartment and they stayed there for several years uh, while they established uh, work force uh, careers. And they started uh, when Elder Parsons decided to uh, start parceling out land in the pine bush. My grandparents were a couple that took him up on his offer to uh, buy some land in the pine bush. And uh, he didn't, they didn't have the money to pay him in full, but they, the, the church was so connected to its parishioners that they had an honor system that you would pay as much as you could until your land debt was paid off. And that's how they were able to purchase the land. They, mm -hmm. they bought the land and they uh, uh, purchased it little by little as they could afford to. And and 1944 is when they they moved there uh, in 1942, but they they would go back and forth and garden and farm the land once they were able to clear the land because as Jennifer said, the land was undeveloped at that time, so they had to clear the land. And then once they cleared the land, they started farming the land and making gardens. You could see gardens as far as the eye can see up and down Rap Road. After they finished uh, uh, gardening and, and farming and they had livestock, chickens, pigs, they had uh, different, uh, some of them had a horse and uh, they, they just little by little, started establishing the Rap Road community. 1944, my grandparents decided there was too much uh, back and forth from the South End to uh, Rap Road. My grandmother was a very industrious woman and she decided they needed to try to build a home on Rap Road so they didn't have to travel back and forth so much. Mm -hmm. So what she did was uh, my grandfather started building a, a big house, what was known as the big house. And he wanted the big house so that that would be their permanent home. Well, it was during the depression and the war and materials were very hard to come by. So it, it, it was a very slow process for him to build his home. My grandmother, as I said, being an industrious woman decided she was going to build a house, a temporary home for them so that they could get to Rap Road. And so my grandfather was gonna continue to build his big house while my grandmother built her little house 
And when he saw the progress she was making building her little house, he decided to join forces with her and helped her finish building the little house. And it was a little shotgun house with a dirt floor and, and the, they used a newspaper to insulate the walls and very meager beginnings, very meager beginnings. And so that's how they established themselves on Rap Road. It took my grandfather five years to build that permanent big house. And in 1949, the home was completed enough that they could move into the home. The other thing I'd like to talk about real quick is the educational component. The education that they had in the Albany School District was fine. The problem was when they moved to the Pine Bush, the school district said they could not pick up the children that lived in the Rap Road community because the Rap Road community had one little dirt lane and the school bus, they said, could not go down that lane and turn around to take the kids back to uh, school. So the church, again, being very instrumental and in the lives of the people, especially uh, those who opted to live in the Rap Road community. And by the way, there were 23 families that's eventually settled in the Rap Road community. And of those 23 homes, we still have about 14 of those homes that still exist. Uh, some of them are in excellent condition. Some of them are in poor condition. But getting back to the school bus situation, they had to uh, take and figure out a way to get their kids to the main the kids would have to walk to the main highway, which was a, a it was a good distance for small children uh, to go to the main highway. So the church purchased a bus, but they needed to widen the road so that the bus had a point where it could turn around. At, and there was an intersection where there was another lane called Springsteen Lane. And the men in the community took a machine and widened the road enough for the bus to turn around so that they would be able to get the children uh, and come in to Rap Road and pick up the children and be able to turn them around where they had widened the, the lanes. So once the lanes were uh, widened, now they could take the children. The problem was who was gonna drive the school bus? My grandmother, as I said, being the industrious woman that she was, she volunteered to drive the school bus so the children could go to and fro to school. And uh, I'd like to think that she was probably the first black female bus driver in the city of Albany because he drove that school bus for quite a while uh, so that the children could get to and fro to school. Uh, they, as Jennifer said, they were very, very much uh, attached to the church. Wilburn's Temple is a church that even today, you have that continuity and, and, and the closeness of the, the parishioners that, that reside at that church. It's a, it's a beautiful church. It was at one point a Jewish synagogue and they bought that church when urban renewal would, uh, would be coming through downtown Albany and displace them from 79 Hamilton Street. And in 1957, they marched from the, where the old church had been to the new church, which is that Jewish synagogue at 121 J Street. And that's where we worship today. 
and the church is thriving and it still continues on. And uh, it was because of my grandparents and other neighbors, some were church family, some were actually family that persevered and they worked hard to cultivate and develop this land that we are still here today. Mm -hmm. And I, I am just so thankful that uh, my Aunt Emma Dixon, I always like to mention my Aunt Emma Dixon because she and Jennifer were the ones that took the time and the effort to document a lot of this information. And uh, when my aunt got sick in 2007, uh, the, the work came to a standstill for a minute. And in 2010, I said, no, we have to keep the history going. We can't lose our history. And that's when Stephanie joined forces with me and some other good people, I call them a few other good people. And we've been fortunate enough to try to keep our history alive and making people aware. And I wanna thank everyone that's on this uh, Zoom meeting for allowing us to share a little bit of our history with you. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions because I gave you a very condensed version of our history here in the Rap Road community. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie. Thank you so much, Beverly. I'm just gonna chime in really quickly here because I wanna be um, conscious of time. Uh, I would love to invite um, Jennifer and Carla to come back on screen and hopefully the four of you can have uh, a bit of a conversation um, touching on everything that you all talked about um, and Stephanie talking about your experience with the Rap Road Historical uh, Association as well. Um, and hopefully we can wrap up by 5.30. I know we got started a little bit late because of my computer having a little bit of a meltdown. So thank you all for uh, bearing with us here. Um, but I, I think this history is fascinating and obviously the work that Beverly and Stephanie are doing with Rap Road Historical Association is amazing. And I encourage everyone to look them up. I will drop the link to their website in the chat um, so that you can see that, but I'll, I'll go away now for a little while and uh, let the four of you take it um, from here. Thanks. Sure. I just want to, um, just as uh, the, on the Rap Road Historical Association, I sit on the board. I am speaking for the board. We just want to thank um, the Preservation League of New York for inviting us for this very, very wonderful presentation and to align our stories with a great book that I have read uh, myself. Um, and, you know, Jennifer, uh, you know, we just, you know, we can't say enough. We just can't say enough. I mean, she's written a book about our community. When we ask for assistance and help, um, she's there for us and to keep us along. Uh, relevant in the capital district. Um, the, you, you know, Rap Road stays under duress all the time. Um, we represent just 1% of the federal preservation that's related to African-American historic sites. We do our fundraising so diligently so that we can make sure that people um, know we are here and what we do for the capital district. Um, we are thankful for all the members who sit on the board who work tirelessly to help preserve Rap Road and for all of the other historic associations that we work with that helps us to provide us with resources so that we can continue to support the Rap Road Historical District. Um, once again, thank you to the Preservation League for inviting um, us to present our story as we have migrated from Shibuta, Mississippi, Florida, Mobile, Alabama, all the Carolinas just for a better way of life and we continue to work hard so that the families on Rap Road can stay on Rap Road. So thank you. So I actually have a question for Carla. Um, you mentioned that your um, the reason you got interested in the Great Migration was because of your uh, your grandmother. Were you able to interview her for your dissertation and, and other family members? Because I think that's the fun part. So unfortunately, she actually um, passed before I finished my dissertation. 
But what allowed me to know more about her story was an assignment I got as an undergrad um, in a Black urban studies class to write my family history or my history of migration. And so um, I asked her and that paper was the genesis of my interest um, in this migration. So it definitely was her personal story. I see some of the questions in Q&A um, that we're asking just about some of the logistics about New York City um, migration and the Navy Yards. I think her, her story is pretty interesting because she had some connections to um, Harlem from people who had migrated from the same general area that she lived in. And so in Virginia, and so she was able to use the networks that were there to come to Harlem, find a place to stay. She had a cousin, um, she said his name, was, they called him Dickie, right? His, his name was Cousin Dickie and she came and stayed with him in Harlem. And then she came and ended up moving to Westchester where a couple of, of family members, um, extended family members had settled. And so those connections were so important for her finding work and finding a place to live. Um, and so just to kind of give that, that general sense. Interesting. That's, it's funny that you said that um, the Dickey, because when I was first introduced to the Rep Road community um, by Emma Dixon, who was Beverly's cousin, right Beth? Um, she would send me out to the community. And the reason I got in, involved in the initially was because um, the Rep Road community wanted to be placed on the state register of historic places. And I needed to write a research paper. Um, and so we kind of came together and I said, well, Emma, I'm like, I think my research paper can serve as the basis for the historical nomination. And turns out it could. And so I would show up at her house and she would send me out to um, so-and-so's house to interview him. And she'd call him up and she'd say, Jennifer's coming over. She's going to ask questions. You better answer that. You better answer her questions. <laughs> so it was because Emma <laughs> would send me over and she'd warn these people I was coming. And she said, you got to answer the questions. <laughs> we need this. Um, but the thing that took me for years to figure out is that they all had nicknames for each other that were not their, um, their, their actual legal birth names. So it took me years to figure out everybody's nickname is, oh, that's that person and this person. So um, it was a lot of fun, but it took a lot of work to figure out who was. They were to. pseudo names. Yes. yes, everybody on Rep Road has a nickname. <laughs> and they still are guarded like that yeah. to this day. Yeah, so, so very similar, but it, it, did, it took me a long time to, to figure out the whole family tree. <laughs> Thankfully, um, the Bronx Historical Society had started um, in conjunction with Fordham University, um, an oral history project. And so they were beginning to take oral histories and record the oral histories. And so that gave me a lot of the people um, and their personal stories that I wrote about. And so that was so helpful. Um, so public history is so important <laughs> um, yeah. for historians to be able to write these stories, yeah. especially for, for, excuse me, time periods where the people are getting older or are no longer with us. Yeah, and I think Bev and Stephanie have done a great job of um, reporting the folks that are left um, and, and the work of the Rap Road Historical is, is so important now because you know, with each passing year, unfortunately, time, time takes a toll on that history. So. And I'd, I'd like to jump in and just say that Right now, we're facing a very uh, serious situation where the, the community is going to be greatly impact uh, if and when this project takes place with uh, one of the malls here in our backyard that came here back in the 70s. And um, we've been working really hard trying to figure out how to keep our community from being so impacted should this change take place. And this has been something that the Rap Road community has struggled with ever since 1971 when they put a major uh, highway 
through the middle of our community. And uh, we, we struggle. And as Jennifer said, to try to preserve and, and keep our history alive because we are probably one of the only communities that we're aware of that started directly as a result of the great migration. And uh, it, it's important that we keep this piece of history alive. It's, uh, it's very, very important that uh, we get the word out to people such as yourselves so that you're aware. And that's our mission to make people aware so that we can preserve this bit of history for, of the great migration from the uh, South to Albany, New York. And uh, we're doing everything in our power to yeah. do that. The, the Rap Road really is a, a special place. Um, and if you drive through it today, um, it doesn't seem like it's, it, it's rural, but when it was first um, established and for many decades afterwards, they were the only folks out in the pine bush. Um, and it wasn't until, when did Washington Avenue extension? Or, or 1971. Um, and I remember Emma, Emma telling stories about um, folks driving down Washington Avenue extension and just, what are these people doing out here? We didn't even know they were out there. Um, so it's, it's really unusual that African-Americans established a rural community um, in upstate New York and were able to, to purchase land and purchase housing. Um, and I think that's what makes it so special is that you're still there. And the interesting thing is the original houses are still here and they were dug by hand and they use cinder blocks to build their foundations. Some of the homes have been rehabbed in recent years, thank God. And uh, there are some that we are still hoping and praying we can preserve. Uh, and that's why, as uh, Stephanie mentioned, we do the fundraising as often as we can because we somehow, we've got to try to preserve these buildings that are in disrepair so that we don't lose them. But they dug these homes by hand and some were, most were built by uh, lumber, uh, some were built by brick, but the men of the community were the ones that come together and built these homes by hand, helping one another with, with whatever their expertise and skill was. Some were carpenters, some were masons, some were electricians. It just depended what your skill was. You pitched in and helped build these homes. And today, thank God, mo most of them, we lost several of them, but most of them are still, still standing. And uh, because when the highway came through, it split the community in half. And actually the people that lived on the opposite side of the highway were given the opportunity to move across the highway. Only one family opted to do that. And their home was moved closer to uh, the opposite side of Rap Road. Unfortunately, um, that house managed to get dismantled all except for the uh, foundation. So we ended up losing it anyway, but the foundation still stands there where the house once stood. Also, I just wanna um, mention when we talk about the community and we talk about the houses, um, just a year ago, I had an opportunity to go to Mobile, um, Alabama. I have been to Shibuta, Mississippi as well. And what I have noticed uh, just growing up and knowing both locations and where our family has come from, uh, Rap Road represents exactly what you would see in Shibuta, Mississippi or in Mobile, Alabama. Family living very close together um, in original homes that they have built either by another family member or they built themselves. 
Uh, also, one of the things that I noticed when I was in uh, Mobile, Alabama, was that on that block, um, since I was a kid, only one house has been demolished, and one house was uh, was torn down and resurrected again. So, but living with a fam a descendant. So it was a mother's house who was, their house was um, demolished and the daughter rebuilt the house in the same location as the original. So that's the one thing I remember so much when I am on Rap Road is it really brings me back to Shibuta, Mississippi and to Mobile, Alabama, because that's just how we live. And so now I think about myself, you know, jokingly, that's how I live. I live next door to my parents <laughs> and, um, and my grandmother and my mother's mother lived in North Albany and her grandson lived across the street from her. So it's just how we live and how we have brought that heritage to the Northeast or wherever we decided to settle that we continue to live as a, a community. Hey, thank you all so much for sharing your experience, your research. This was amazing. And I, I think I can speak for everybody who tuned in that this was definitely a great way to spend the afternoon. Your stories are super important and we're just happy to offer a platform to help you tell them. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier, I really encourage everybody to uh, look up the Rap Road Historical Association. Beverly, Stephanie, and the community there are doing great things to protect and preserve that history. Um, Dr. Jennifer Lamack at the New York State Museum is doing great work researching upstate New York communities and among other things at the museum. And Dr. Carla DuBose-Simons um, is teaching at Westchester Community College. And thank you all for being with us today. Um, I really enjoyed listening to you share your experience. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, thank you for spending your afternoon with us and for bearing with us while we um, dealt with some unforeseen technical issues. Uh, from everybody at the Preservation League, thank you so much. We have lots of great programs coming up. You can visit our website to find out more. Um, if anybody ever has any questions, comments, suggestions, uh, you can feel free to email us, info at preservenys.org. Um, if anybody had questions that we didn't quite get to, I will take a look through the chat and the Q&A and follow up as necessary. Um, but other than that, just thank you so much. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Jen.